found him on the other side of the lake. They asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for bread that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, What must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, What sign then will you give us that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Amen. This is God's word. Let's take a moment to pray together that God will teach us this morning. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your mercy towards us. And we thank you that the entrance of your word brings light. And I pray it would do exactly that this morning, that in particular it would direct our eyes to Christ and that we would be ready to feed on him spiritually as we place our faith in him again for eternal life and as our souls are satisfied with the bread that he gives. And Father, I would pray in particular this morning for other ministries that announce the bread of life. I pray especially for my friend Neil Quinn uh, serving up in Michigan as they look to launch their church plant officially today and begin meeting as an assembly. I pray you would bless that. I pray it's going well for him, that you'd give him a calm heart and mind, that he would rejoice in whatever you do, and that all that you've raised up to help him and work with him and labor with him and and worship with him, that it would be a good day and a good start. And that would be a church that grows into a particular church that administers the gospel for the good of all the people they can, and even out to the very ends of the earth. We also pray for the Mays, Gerald and Debbie, uh, that you would bless them. Thank you for keeping them safe with many uh, disasters in Japan this year. I pray that you would uh, provide more pastors for their area, that you would save this Mrs. Kazumitsu that Debbie shares the gospel with often, and that you would remember the missionary Lois Seeley with cancer, that you would be merciful to her. Lord, we also pray for Bruce Chelta at, at Powell if they're meeting this morning. And for Matt Patrick at Wofford, that you would bless their ministries again with the salvation of souls, that they're offering the bread of life to those who are in need. I pray you create a hunger in their audience and a hunger in those they reach, that they might be able to give Christ who satisfies. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In John chapter 4, which is two chapters before the passage we've just read today, Jesus tells the woman at the well that if she drinks from the water that Jesus offers her, she will never be thirsty again. And this is Jesus talking to a woman who had had five husbands, who was living with a man that she was not married to, who had been shunned by her community. Even the disciples are astonished that Jesus would speak to her. And yet to her, Jesus offers the water of life that will satisfy her deepest longings. And the story of the prodigal son, the younger son wants his inheritance. He wants his money before his dad dies. And when he gets it, he uses it to buy friends, to buy pleasure, to live it up. But when the money is gone, he has to return home in disgrace. And instead of the father shunning him, instead of the son coming home to condemnation, the father shames himself by running. You didn't do that in that society. By running out to greet this returning son and restoring him to the home and lavishing good things on him in the process. And finally, in the book of Genesis, Leah, Rachel's older sister, she is unloved by her husband Jacob. 
He only married her in the first place because he was tricked into it. And he clearly prefers her younger sister. The Bible even records the Lord saw that Leah was not loved. And because of this, God gives her children. But each time she has a child, she thinks, okay, finally, this is what will make my husband love me. He will pay attention to me. And each time she is disappointed. And finally, she gives birth to her last son, and she names him Judah with this comment, this time I will praise the Lord. Perhaps an indication that although her husband still does not love her, she has finally found a greater love, a greater satisfaction in her soul from the Lord himself. You see, the Bible is just full of stories like this where God in his mercy satisfies us with the things we really need. And John 6 brings that out in this very well-known bread of life discourse. And at the beginning of the chapter, Jesus performs the well-known miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. And the people who witness this miracle, they think this is the king that they've been waiting for. And so they want to make him a king by force. They're ready for him to take over, to defeat all the Romans, and to keep giving them this delicious food that he has just fed them with. But you see, Jesus, he has a different goal in mind. He's going to bring about God's kingdom a very different way, a kingdom that's not of this world. And so he goes across the lake in the middle of the night, and when the people wake up the next morning, they can't find him, so they follow him. And when they finally track him down, they ask him for more bread. And that's the occasion that Jesus uses to deliver this discourse or this sermon on the bread of life. And in the sermon, he offers them the bread their souls need satisfaction from their inner being if only they will believe in him and incorporate him into their lives fully. So before we come to the Lord's table this morning where we will eat bread and drink wine that reminds us of the work of Christ, the bread of life, let's look at this discourse together where Christ promises us eternal life for all who believe in him. And let's look at it from two angles. First, humans have a spiritual need that nothing earthly, that no earthly bread can ever satisfy. Throughout the Gospel of John, people are often misunderstanding Jesus. When he told them in John 2, I'm going to destroy this temple and rebuild it in three days, they didn't understand that he was talking about the temple of his body. They thought he meant the Jerusalem temple. When he tells Nicodemus in the next chapter, you need to be born again, Nicodemus thinks Jesus is talking about an adult somehow re-entering his mother and being reborn. And when he offers the woman at the well the water of life, she says, well, from what well do I get this water? And we might think, well, how could those people be so thick that they would misunderstand Jesus? It's not just that they're misunderstanding. They think Jesus is the one who's thick. That what he's saying is absurd and impossible because they can't grasp the spiritual message that he is trying to illustrate for them. And we see that again here in John 6. When the crowds catch up with Jesus the day after the feeding of the 5,000, they again object to what he is saying because they don't want to deal with the ramifications of what he is saying, of embracing the bread of life and maybe laying aside some of their preconceptions and some of what they desire to get from Christ. And why is that? Why that objection? Because we as humans, we all have this tendency to think that we can satisfy an inner need, a spiritual need, an eternal need with something that is merely earthly. And it really is on display, I think, three particular ways in these opening verses, the verse we read. One, we tend to ignore the spiritual dimensions of our lives. That's a a temptation that we all face. In verse 25, the crowds finally catch up with Jesus, and they ask him, when did you get here? That is, across the lake. Now, if you notice verse 26, Jesus doesn't actually answer their question. He just goes to the root motive of why they're looking for him, In the first place, look at verse 26. Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, 
You are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Jesus had served them a good meal. And on the basis of that alone, they were ready to sign up for this discipleship thing and follow him. If if only it meant they could keep getting a good meal. They had missed the significance of what that meal, what that sign was pointing to. It was a miracle or a sign pointing beyond itself to something more significant, and they had missed that. And Jesus tells them then in verse 27, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Jesus is saying, listen, friends, you're more than physical beings. You have a spiritual dimension. And the food that you eat physically, it doesn't last forever. What you need is bread that does endure forever. And don't misunderstand Jesus' point. He isn't simply saying, I'm that bread of life. I last forever. Here's his point. Since he lasts forever, he can give a life. He can give bread that sustains your life forever spiritually. You see, if you don't eat food, you will eventually die. That's how God has made us as finite beings. And if you don't eat, you'll die sooner rather than later. But even if you eat regularly, you're still going to die one day. So what you need is a life that extends beyond that. And I don't just mean a mere existence. I mean a blessed existence, a resurrection body, heaven with God when you die, and a resurrection body when he comes again. And what Jesus is saying is, I'm the bread that gives that life. And if you want to live past just the here and now, not just live and exist, but escape the condemnation of hell and live blessedly with me into eternity, then you need the bread that I have. And friends, I think what Jesus is challenging us to think about in this passage is is where are we investing all of our energy? Where's our security? Where is our satisfaction? Are are we focused for the main part on keeping ourselves alive, sustaining our physical life, providing for the future, making decisions now so that you know down the road, okay, I'll, I'll have everything I need. Everything is provided for. Taking good care of your kids. And by the way, is anything that I just mentioned a bad thing? No, it's not. Those are all good things, even things God calls us to do. But do we do them to the neglect of our souls. See, that's the question we have to grapple with. What consumes my time and energy? What consumes my focus and especially my trust? And am I investing in the physical to the neglect of the spiritual? Because that's what Jesus is saying to them. What he says in another passage, man cannot live by bread alone, but the life that God gives, it will sustain you into eternity. So we tend to neglect the spiritual dimensions of our lives, or we're going to face that temptation, all of us. Two, we will face the temptation to labor, to work, when God calls us to believe. Notice the flow of the narrative. The crowds are intrigued by Jesus' command when he says, work for food that endures to eternal life. And so they ask him in verse 28, okay, what must we do to do the works God requires? What are they saying? All right, we, we got to work for eternal life. We got to work for this food. We can do that. Jesus, tell us what God wants us to do. And Jesus says in verse 29, the work of God is this to believe in the one he has sent. What Jesus tells them is that God actually doesn't require labor, he requires that you believe in Jesus, the one whom God has sent. As Jesus said, I have the bread of life and I will give it to you because God has set his seal of approval on me. Don Carson is a writer I like to read and he has observed, he does a lot of university missions 
and he has observed in doing university missions, he, he's noticed three trends that students wrestle with, and particularly female students tend to feel these three things, whether, whether explicitly or implicitly. One, they should get good grades. Two, they should take leadership and campus organizations. And three, they should be pretty. So they have to do all those things in order to be accepted by their peers. And that, of course, leads to its own problems, its own temptations, and its own struggles. And when these ladies come to faith in Christ, and thankfully, by God's grace, many of them do, when they come to faith in Christ, Carson has observed, while Jesus is the answer to those problems, they don't just immediately go away. They don't come to Christ and then suddenly, immediately feel completely free from those three pressures. In fact, it's not long until many of those ladies add a fourth pressure to their life. And can you guess what it is? It is to be the best Christian on campus. So now, in addition to all those other things, now they need to go to Bible studies, and they need to join university fellowships, and they need to be involved in evangelism and prayer teams and take leadership in all these organizations. Why? Why are they feeling that pressure? Because all of us, humans, male or female, when our eyes are opened to that spiritual dimension of our lives, we tend to think, okay, I'll embrace it with a works mindset. All right, I've been neglecting the spiritual and God has opened my eyes, so I'm just going to grab this thing and do everything I can. What does God require me to do? And Jesus is saying, I don't want you to do anything other than trust in the one that God has sent. I want you to find your rest in him. I want you to find your identity in him. I want you to find your acceptance in him. Why? Because he's the one who spiritually satisfies not those who work, but those who trust, those who believe. And thirdly, the temptation we face is to want or even to demand more proof when we ignore what God has already shown us and what God has already told us. Jesus challenges the crowd to trust him. They respond by asking, okay, how do we know that you are a trustworthy object of faith? Look at verses 30 and 31. What sign then will you give that we may see it and believe it? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written, he, Moses, gave them bread from heaven to eat and so fill it in. So what are you going to do, Jesus? Now, there is a great irony in that question, is there not? Because this is the crowd that is following Jesus in the first place because he fed the 5,000 They ate that meal with him, and they want to see more. So was that not a sufficient sign that they should believe that this is the one whom God has sent? Apparently, they want more. They want something more spectacular. They need more convincing. And when they appeal to the manna in the wilderness, they're saying, okay, Moses did that, so you do better. You fed us in the wilderness. He fed us in the wilderness. So now let's up the game. You show us a little bit more so that we can trust you. And what does Jesus do? He doesn't offer them more proof. If he did, he would be catering to the crowd. He would be catering to their mistaken aspirations. Remember, they want to make Jesus king. And Jesus is not going to cater that. Instead, he tells them two things there in verses 32 and 33. Number one, God was the one working through Moses. It wasn't Moses himself. It was God working through Moses. And two, what God did through Moses anticipates me. The manna in the wilderness was looking forward to the bread of life, Jesus himself, that God would give you. In other words, do you want more proof? I'm right here. I'm standing in front of you, Jesus says. And that's all the proof you need. Earlier in John 5, Jesus had said, if you believed Moses, you would believe me for he wrote about me. Everything that Jesus, or that God was doing with Moses and throughout the Old Testament, God was announcing in advance what he would do through Christ. And so at this point, these crowds, they don't need any more proof. They have the scriptures. They have the witness of the Old Testament. And here's the good news. This is what I love about this passage. Jesus is saying, if you'll just trust me, you'll see it all points to me. You won't be disappointed. 
If you just trust me, you'll see that I am who I claim to be. So at this point, Jesus is saying, it's not time for another sign. It's time for you to trust. Ironically, Jesus will do one more sign, the greatest sign, the resurrection from the dead. That is God's confirmation that everything Jesus had said and did was true and right and good. And Jesus is saying, it's time for you to believe in me and take a risk and trust that I am who I claim to be. And at this point, they're not ready. Verse 34, sir, always give us this bread. They're still thinking, okay, you'll give us better bread than Moses, so give it to us. And they're not grasping that he is offering them himself. He's got something much greater in mind than bread. So let's go on and look at that from the second half of the passage, our second angle, which is this. Jesus satisfies our souls with eternal life. He lays it right out in verse 35. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. In other words, what your souls need more than anything else is Jesus. He alone will satisfy those needs, those doubts, and those desires. And he does it how? By giving us not stuff, but by giving us himself. Isaiah in the Old Testament cries out, with this invitation. Come, all you who are thirsty. Come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest of fare. Jesus is offering them himself. Now, as I've said, the crowd isn't ready to accept this. Look at verse 36. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. And so what Jesus is going to do in the the final verses of this discourse is he's going to assure them, you can trust me. I will satisfy your souls. He's going to make it clear to them that he is indeed a trustworthy object of faith. And I want to see the three ways, three ways he does that before we come to the Lord's table quickly. One, God has determined, he has planned, he has fixed that he will satisfy our souls with Jesus. The crowd isn't ready to hear, but that isn't going to damage Jesus' ability to satisfy their souls. Look at verse 37. He says, all those the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. And what Jesus is doing here, it almost seems odd that in the middle of the sermon on come to me and trust me, he then wants to make this statement assuring them that those indeed that the Father has chosen will come. It almost seems antithetical. Why offer it to the crowds and then say, well, the ones the fathers have chosen, they're the ones who are going to come? Because he's assuring them that he can and will satisfy their souls, that he is a trustworthy object of faith, and he is assuring us who take the risk and trust him that we will never be disappointed, that he is who he claims to be. You see, in Jesus' day, there was a lot of rejection of him. And in our society today, there is a lot of rejection of Jesus. In fact, with the the spread of information in a global world, maybe we're even more aware of competing religions, competing claims to truth, attacks on Jesus' character. And it it can shake you sometimes, or it can trouble you, can't it? And maybe you look around at all the options on display and and, and what looks like so much rejection, and you begin to wonder, is he really who he says he is? Can he really satisfy my soul? Is is he safe? Is he really the only option? And Jesus is there assuring them. My father has given a group of people to the son, and I, the son, he says, I will preserve them. They will come to me. 
verse 37. According to verse 40, they will look to me and believe in me. I will receive them. According to verse 39, I will make sure that none of those who are given to me and come to me are lost, and I will raise them back to life on the last day. Jesus is assuring them, I don't care how much rejection there is, I will save those whom the Father has given me. I won't lose them. I won't lose you. No matter what rejection there is, I am trustworthy and reliable. And if we think, well, okay, well, then it's just going to be that little microscopic group of people that come to Jesus while, while untold millions and billions perish. No, God said to Abraham, if you can count the sand on the sea, then you can count your spiritual descendants. If you can count the stars in the sky, then you can count your spiritual descendants. But in heaven, it is an innumerable multitude that no man can count that the Father gave to the Son and calls to him in time. And notice before we move on from this point, verse 38, Jesus saying, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. In other words, Jesus is saying, I have come to save my people from their sin. Nothing will thwart that, no matter how many object. In other words, rather than the statement on the sovereignty of God almost making it look bad, almost making God look bad, how can, how can he offer the gospel to all these people, but then say, hey, it's those whom the Father has chosen. It's the other way around, Jesus says. If any of my elect fail to reach glory, I look bad. It's as if I was disobedient or as if I was unable to do what I came to do. And so, my friends, here the heartwarming nature of this doctrine. As Jesus assures us we can trust him, he will satisfy us with himself. He has staked his glory on it. Two, God overcomes our objections when we trust Jesus. He claims to be the bread from heaven, and he promises eternal life to his people. And so soon another objection surfaces. The Jews say in verse 42, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? And Jesus responds in verse 43, stop grumbling among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day. As it is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the father and learned from him comes to me. You see, the Jews, they're hearing Jesus, and they're just trying to put all the pieces together. They've got their own misconceptions and preconceptions blinding them, and they're hearing the words of Jesus, and they're just trying to put all the pieces together, and they're thinking, okay, we can reason, we can figure this out, We can come to understand, and you know what Jesus is telling them? You can't figure it out on your own. You can't put all the pieces together on your own. You just don't have the ability within you. There's not a vantage point where you can finally see down and figure out how it all works together. You know what you need? You just need God to draw you to me. You just need God to convince you that it's true. And when you do, you will have eternal life. And again, I just, I just want to make it clear. Jesus is pointing again to God's sovereignty here, that the Father must draw you. But his point isn't to say, you need to believe in me, but too bad, you can't believe in me unless God lets you. What, is, what he's saying is, you can't reach me on your own, but God will bring you. The prophet said they will all be taught by God. You trust God. You take a risk with him, so to speak. And he will convince you that it is so. He will show you how it all works out together, but you've got to commit to him. You've got to believe in me. And from that position, things will begin to make sense. And maybe we feel that either with our own lives or, or maybe with sharing it with others. You know, what if all this religion stuff is just hokey and it's people just trying to make money and it's people just trying to get power? What if, what if? And Jesus is saying, you trust me. And it'll all make sense. I won't disappoint you. I promise, he says. And finally, God gives us Jesus' own life so that we will live forever. 
in the final verses, God says, you know how you're going to get all this bread of life? It's not just a mere transaction. I'm going to give you my own son. Look at verses 53 to 55. Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day, for my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Now, maybe we come to these last verses, and you're thinking, okay, this sounds really strange, and it certainly sounded strange to those who were hearing Jesus. But when he tells them, eat my flesh, drink my blood, it's not some kind of weird reference to the Lord's table, and it's certainly not even any kind of cannibalism. Jesus is trying to say, you got to trust me, that is, you need to incorporate me into your life. Just like the body takes in food and it sustains you, it becomes a part of you, Jesus is saying, you've got to take me in. You've got to incorporate me. And how are you going to do that? By trusting him. Look just for a moment before we move on. Verse 40. I want you to notice the parallel. Jesus says, My Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. Now look at 54. Notice how similar it is. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. What's the end result in both verses? We are raised up to life on the last day. According to verse 54, we get that by eating and drinking Jesus. According to verse 40, we get it by believing in him. And the earlier language explains the later. Jesus is saying, you got to take me in. How? By believing in me, by trusting me, and I will give you eternal life. We still talk this way sometimes. We devour books, drink in lectures, swallow stories, ruminate on ideas, chew over a matter, or sometimes eat our own words. Maybe as a grandparent, you have said you could just eat up your grandchildren. What are we saying? We take these things in. And Jesus is saying, when you believe in me, when you trust me, when you commit yourself to me, then you're going to have the eternal life. You're going to take me in, and you're going to get me at the very price of myself. Because God is giving us his very own flesh, his very own blood, to satisfy our souls. So can you trust Jesus for eternal life? Yes, you can. He staked his glory on it. He's promised it, and he's sealed it with his own blood. So let's give thanks for that as we get ready to come now to the Lord's table. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for the gift of Christ. Thank you for giving him to us. And as we come now to eat at your table, may we commune with you by faith and know more and more the satisfaction in our souls that you give us through Christ. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing hymn 325 while the elders come and make ready the table. And we'll just sing verses 1 and 2. Hymn 325, Hear, O my Lord, I see thee face to face. Stand with me, please.
be seated for a moment while I read these words of institution and make just one final comment from John 6 before we come to the Lord's table. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I made the comment there at the very end of the message that John 6, with its language of eating Jesus' flesh and drinking his blood, is, is not some veiled, strange reference to the Lord's table. He, Christ himself had not even announced communion yet. And to think of communion as eating the flesh of Jesus in a literal manner uh, would go against the data of Scripture. It's, it's never suggested that we're partaking of him physically when we eat at the Lord's table. But while John 6 is not about the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Supper is about John 6. And what I mean by that is here we have the symbols God has given to direct our attention to the Son of God that we might commune with Him by faith. God has given us this table as an opportunity to strengthen our faith, to, uh, to, to show even through the senses the gospel, that Christ's body was broken, that his blood was shed, and that by partaking of him by faith, we have eternal life. And so Paul will say in the previous chapter that when we eat the bread, there's that communion with Christ's body, with the benefits of his broken body. And when we drink the cup, there's communion with his blood, There's, there's communion with the benefits of his shed blood as we come to him in faith. So as we Come to the Lord's table today. Take that moment just to rejoice in Christ, to search your soul, to confess whatever sins God brings to your mind through his word, and then to come and eat and rejoice in Christ. This is the Lord's table, as we say each time. It's not Robux table or the PCA's table. This is for all the Lord's people who know and love him, that you're not under the discipline of this or any other church, but that you have indeed at some point confessed your faith and been received into the membership of an evangelical Bible-believing church. And if that is your profession, then we welcome you to come and eat with us. So I'm going to ask now the men to come forward so that they can distribute the elements, and I'm going to ask Brother E.L. to pray before we distribute the bread. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the supreme sacrifice that you had, that you made on Calvary's cross, Father, for our sins. Father, as we come before your table this morning, this, this morning Father, may we ever, ever be mindful of what the sacraments mean. As we take this bread, which represents your body, may we do it in remembrance of you. And we sing to you now. Amen. Amen.
Brothers and sisters, remember that the Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, as I, ministering in his name, give this bread to you, and said, take, eat, this is my body which is for you, do this in remembrance of me. Ask the men to come forward. We might also distribute the cup. The same manner he also took the cup, and having given thanks as he has been done in his name, he gave it to the disciples, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Drink from it, all of you. And as often as we eat the bread and drink the cup, we show forth our Lord's death until he comes. Let's give thanks together. Father in heaven, thank you for the blood of Christ which takes away our sins and the bread of life which satisfies our souls. As we're sent back out this week into the world, nourish us and sustain us with yourself that we might live for you, love you, know your grace and comfort, share your good news with others and anticipate the heavenly feast in the kingdom of God. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're